This is Spencer with MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Andy Meyer, who um, you know from many other films, Fried Green Tomatoes, One Crazy Summer, um, but you are in town specifically for the 30th anniversary of The Breakfast Club, correct? which you were a producer on. Um, I can't tell chronologically which occurred first, because IMDb is a little vague, but was this the first movie that you produced? The Breakfast Club was, and then I made uh, Birdie, starring Nick Cage, which won the grand prize at Cannes, and then I made Better Off Dead with John Cusack. <laughs> pretty, pretty good run there. Yeah. It was all sort of in a two-year period. Yeah, I was it, it looked like there three, was a whole bunch jam-packed. Three there. movies at once, um, and then later on, Fried Green Tomatoes, of course. What is that sort of like? I mean, I guess you have to talk about it retrospectively at this point, but looking back and that being sort of first experience as a producer, uh, what that experience was like filming and what it's since gone on to become, I guess, culturally. Culturally in terms of the films? Well, just like how beloved it is, how much it's influenced, you know, oh, the breakfast movies club. and stuff. Yeah, exactly, Breakfast Club. Well, The Breakfast Club and, and everyone who was here today, Molly and Allie, we would all say the same thing. No one made The Breakfast Club and then said, you know, let's meet in 30 years and have it be re remastered, re-released, have it premiered. There was none of that talk. It was a nice little film. John had made 16 Candles, but this was his second film. Actually, we committed to John directing The Breakfast Club first, but decided to wait uh, and do 16 Candles first and then Breakfast Club second. And... It was, you know, one of the series of John Hughes films that became sort of legendary and iconic, but no one anticipated that The Breakfast Club, not Ferris Bueller's Day Off, not Pretty in Pink, Sixteen Candles, because I think The Breakfast Club was such an honest film and spoke so directly to kids and talked about all the stereotypes and peeling away the layers and was really the first semi-serious film for kids, I think that had a lot to do with its staying power. What was sort of the concept heading into it? I mean, was that actually like what you guys sat down and said, like, this is what we want this film to be, we see if we can touch this? I mean, obviously it's become a cultural phenomenon, but at, in, I mean, if you look at it, what it is, it could very easily be an indie film playing at South by Southwest if it were released this year. Like, it's not like a massive giant budget action film or anything like that. It's a group of people talking together and getting to know each other. Um, what was sort of your hope or goal heading into the production before it had its journey? Well, uh, the concept was that I had read a script that John wrote called National Lampoon's Vacation, and I thought it was really funny. <laughs> and I said, who is this guy? And they said, well, he's a guy in Chicago, he's a writer for the Lampoon, we, he's never been to Hollywood, he sold one script. I said, I want to meet him, and I flew to his house, and I said, do you have anything else? And he said, well, I do, but I have to direct it. And red flags were going off in my head, because I didn't know if he knew how to hold the camera. And he said, but I wrote it in one room, and I thought if I wrote it in one room, you might let me direct it. So I read it, and I thought it was fantastic. And we were going to make it as a... I was running a company called A&M Films, a division of A&M Records, a $100 million company. Herb Albert, Jerry wow. Moss, uh, The Carpenters, Joe Cocker, Humble Pie, that whole sting. And I said, we should make this as a low-budget independent movie for a million dollars. And we set to make that movie. We went into pre-production to do a independent, low-budget, $1 million movie version of The Breakfast Club, and then Universal called with some amazing ideas and much more money and it made and distribution, and it made much more sense to join forces with them, which we did, and uh, we produced it with them, and it became a Universal picture. It's an interesting point. Um, I talked to a lot of filmmakers at South by Southwest, and you know, some of them talk about the difficulty in getting their films made in the capacity that they want. Um, did you find there to be any difficulty in sort of navigating that relationship once you'd set it up in that, was, like, they they wanted, you know, I don't know, like, 
Tom Selleck or somebody to play the principal or something, you know, something like that where it would just be like, this isn't really what we're hoping for, but like... It was totally the opposite. That's pretty phenomenal. They brought the best people in the business in. Dee Dee Allen edited the film, one of our iconic editors. I did another movie with her, Milagro Beanfield War. They brought the best people around, John. They rebuilt the uh, library from scratch. They found an, an abandoned gym and made it look so amazing. They had excellent distribution. It was the best thing that ever happened, as opposed to having a little $1 million independent film. We had found an old library we were going to shoot in. Then we had to get distribution. Um, there were no negatives. It's pretty phenomenal. I was reading a whole bunch about the process of casting this movie and hearing about all the various people who were attached or rumored to be attached at some point. What was it like in terms of putting together this really strong group of actors who obviously have gone on to be immensely successful in their own right, but like at the time they were all relatively still pretty young and still pretty unknown. Right. Well, that was done after Universal came in and we were casting in Los Angeles, although I had started casting in Chicago for the independent film, but then we moved it to Los Angeles. And it, it was a, um, I mean, John had very specific ideas and the casting director was fantastic. And we, you know, we didn't have too many misses. We came up with the people that we wanted. What was it actually like working with John Hughes? I mean, he seems to be such a creative genius. Like I heard this was written in two days. Um, what is it like to be working with someone that talented? Is it encouraging for you that you really want to do your best to make it um, as good as it can be? Is it difficult because he has such a strong vision of what exactly he wants? Like, what was that process like? Because obviously he's done so many amazing projects. Well, John would write a screenplay and, you know, the, the, the legend is pretty much true that over a weekend he wrote 16 Candles. I was there. I, I know about it. But once he wrote something, he was done. He was ready to shoot it. He didn't go through the process of getting notes from the studio. I mean, he worked with the actors and took their opinions. But he was very, you know, he knew his subject matter. He knew what he wanted to say. He had a very strong vision. And you would be, quite honestly, an idiot to get in the way of that. So I didn't. You could tell right off the bat yeah. this guy was yeah. maybe something big. Um, that's really interesting. In terms of, like, the film coming together, was it something that was a bit of an uphill battle trying to get audiences initially to um, embrace or try or whatever? It's, it's, I mean, obviously it's found a huge following, not even a cult following, a massive, just pure entertainment following. But it was a dramatic tonal shift from a lot of those teams. I mean, even the stuff that John had worked on prior to that, like 16 Candles, like is much more comedic right. than this. Um, it's essentially like you're reinventing a genre, which it has gone on to do. But was that a difficult thing at all, trying to get audiences to understand this new language of film, essentially, that you guys were presenting to them? Well, we platformed the film. You know, we had great music that, you know, be became a part of the brand and marketing. Uh, and I was with A&M Records, and John actually had found this band, Simple Minds, out of London, who we hadn't even signed yet, but we were about to sign them, and John could have picked any of our major bands. And we had all of these sort of hip elements going for it, as well as uh, great art, great advertising, the picture took off right away. You know, it, it wasn't one that, it wasn't Beats of the Southern Wild, a great film that nobody saw, you yeah. know, and then people discovered it. it. It was a film that just kept growing and growing, and people, it was so easy to relate to it. And it was such an easy conversation to have with your friends to explain it, that that was one of the sort of beautiful aspects of, John's skill coming out of advertising and marketing. He knew how to create a very sellable, tell, you know, one line concept that became a very deep film. And not many people can do that. And I don't think anybody today can do what yeah. he did then. He, he touched a whole 
multiple generations of people in a way that it seems like nobody else. He understood Kids Against Parents better than anybody else. That teenage angst was his, like, calling card. Yeah. If you look at all his films. Yeah. In terms of you personally, what was the effect working on this project had on you? Did it change the way you looked at projects you wanted to attach yourself to? Did it change the way you looked at... Uh, how you thought a film should be made or anything like that. Did this personally influence how you then continued your career as a producer? Every film is different. And, you know, you have to look at each film individually. And the question you have to ask yourself, or that I ask myself, is this, one, worth five years of my life? Is this a timeless film? Because films take so long that... By the time we get it out, we'll, if it's about an issue, will that issue be passed? So I always look for timeless films. And do I want to work with the people I'm getting in business with for five years? And I, that's my criteria for every film I look at. And The Breakfast Club was the first. And then Birdie came along, which is a really hard book to adapt that everybody had passed on. And um, I got Alan Parker to direct it. So that, you know, got that movie made and... It's one of my favorite movies. And then uh, a little comedy. Yeah. Better off dead. Totally different. Three totally, totally different movies. Yeah, totally different. Um, but each but each with, with sort of an individual signature to them. Yeah, incredibly different and unique projects for sure. In terms of the 30th anniversary, what was the sort of um, impetus finally to say like, you know, let's celebrate that. Obviously there are crowds that are ready to celebrate it, but why wasn't it the 25th or the 30th or the 15th? I mean, you could probably do it every every year, or every five years or whatever, and it would totally be okay. embraced. But what was it that this is like, okay, we're really going to go all in? On well, there was a celebration on the 25th, and there was a whole MTV thing that Universal did. But I think if you sort of look at the analytics of how a movie is doing, The Breakfast Club today is as popular as many movies that are out now and Universal recognize that and in a way it, the decision I'm not a part of Universal I'm a producer so you know I, I wasn't in the room for this decision but it's an organic decision you have a picture that every generation loves and the next generation loves and they want more of it and so the idea of giving them more was, I think, a really easy decision to make. In terms of you as a producer, what is it like to have a film that's so iconic be a toucher? I mean, obviously, I guess you have several very, very iconic films on your filmography, but this is probably, I don't know, the crown jewel or whatever. Was it to have that associated with you? Is that something that, like, you embrace every day if somebody comes up to you and you go, oh, you worked on The Breakfast Club, I love that. Uh, or is it something that, like it sort of overshadows maybe other work you worked on or I don't, I don't, I don't know. What is that, what is that like? Because well, it's such a, a I, I, I can tell you my students at the Savannah college of art and design, when they learn that I made the breakfast club, they go bananas. You know what I mean? I understand. And I lecture all around the world. Everywhere I go, they, the kids have seen the breakfast club. I've been in Santiago, Chile, Medellin, Colombia, Panama city, these kids all know The Breakfast Club. So for me, that's very gratifying that it has that kind of universal generational appeal. It's, it's hard to make a movie that, you know, you, you can 30 years later go to Santiago, Chile, and the kids know it and love it. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. There aren't many of those around. That, I mean, maybe there are, but I don't know them. So, uh, it, I mean, I don't think about it every day, but whenever anybody tells me how much they like it, it, it makes me feel great Very nice. it, it makes what I do you know making a movie that makes people so happy uh, is very gratifying and teaching young people and inspiring young minds is very gratifying and if you can do both I think that's a pretty good life Very nice. Um, so the, the 30th uh, anniversary screening is occurring here at South by Southwest is there uh, I, I presume a Blu-ray release is in, today. coming out and co, uh, coinciding it's with being it. It's re released today, and you can go to breakfastclub30.com. The Breakfast Club 30th Anniversary Edition is now available on Blu-ray and DVD. It's also hitting theaters nationwide on March 26th and 31st. Go to Breakfast Club 
4030.com for more details. That's perfect. All right, and in terms of you personally, do you have any other projects that people should keep their eyes out for you, or is there any... Yes, but, to but, but, but today is a day to talk about The Breakfast okay. Club. Well, uh, is there a place people should go to find out more information about you and your work? Do you have a website or anything like that that people should go to? Uh, no. They can Google you or something? Facebook. All right, that's a good place, too. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. I thank wish you, you the best of luck with the 30th anniversary screening today and uh, the nationwide rollout, which is very awesome to hear Well, about. thanks for talking to me. I, I appreciate it. I had a great time. It's a pleasure. Can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This tech don't even try to bite the side of the Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels all right.